Can you guess which of these two brains is the autistic brain? You guessed it, the more lit up one. That is the brain of Temple Grandin, a very famous autistic author and advocate. She just wrote an amazing book called Visual Thinking about how autistic people think in pictures and patterns and abstractions. But isn't it cool to see actual uh, brain differences? I find this uh, fascinating and empowering. Hope you do too. Abram, if you're autistic, how do you understand social norms so much? How are you able to communicate your feelings? My special interest is humans and their brains. I studied humans in college cause they're weird and I learned so many things. I like humans, they are really odd. And I went to therapy and also the mental hospital. There's a study that showed autistic brains produce 42% more information at rest. Go watch this video and come back and watch mine. Do you know why I like this fact more than most? I like this fact because it really does bring into mind why we work 40 hour work weeks, especially for autistic people. If my brain is producing 40% more at rest than the normal person's brain, imagine what it's doing if I'm working 60, 70 hours that week. That's why we burn out so quickly. And it's actually one of the things that I'm building into my own structure of business taking into account how much I produce at rest, and then trying to also understand that the people that I hire are going to also produce 40% more at rest. I want to institute a policy where I'm hiring mostly autistic and neurodivergent individuals. And the reason why is because I want to implement a 20 hour work week. Because that other 20 hours that you're going to be saving, I want you to use that time to focus on interests that you personally want. And to nurture that time, just think about how many more solutions we can come up with collectively if we try. I think it's like a specific kind of hell that my whole life everyone had to make it known that I was other than them and I was different and weird and then those same people once I have an explanation for why it's because I'm like autistic and I can't pick up social cues they refuse to to believe that they think I'm making it up when people don't know I'm autistic they're like wow you're so weird but as soon as I'm like oh that's because I'm autistic they're like no no, no you're normal what the what is it what is, what do you guys want from me Hi, it's 2 a.m. and I may have just figured something out about my life. So if you're an Audi HD or like me, you've probably been told in some form or another to turn down your passion, to stop hyper-focusing, to stop rambling on about your special interests, to basically stop thinking about things so much and so deeply because it's not necessary, blah, 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 blah. And I've noticed as I've gotten older, it gets harder and harder to do the basic tasks in life, including things I want to do and I enjoy. But I realized when I started doing the things that I want to do, I would stop myself in my tracks and be like, oh, you're just obsessing too much, you're thinking about it too much. Like, I was just taking notes on something I enjoy, um, on my special interest of Audi HD and how to navigate life and I was stopping myself because I was like rewriting notes over and over and over and organizing them because I find it fun and it's like a puzzle and it helps me think but in my mind I was like oh you're being obsessive compulsive this is part of your OCD um, you shouldn't be writing them over and over again like this and I was like I'm stopping myself from doing the things I enjoy because I'm trying to see this through a non audi hd lens i've been told these behaviors of thinking over things are overthinking and that overthinking is inherently wrong when i love overthinking i love thinking a lot i love thinking things through in different ways and seeing how i can look at them differently and i truly think that because i've stopped myself from doing this in the areas that i'm interested in doing it in I've stopped myself from being able to make progress in the things that I am not so interested in. It's become difficult for me to differentiate between anxious and passionate overthinking, so I just shut down both, which has made it so that I shut down no matter what I try to do. So I'm trying to embrace my passionate overthinking and overanalyzing again 
and I'm thinking maybe it will help with my everyday anxious overthinking and um, just trying to do those daily tasks. My passion has been pathologized as things like thinking errors and I just need to undo that and embrace my process and really find myself again. Former gifted kid burnout? Every so often I see content roasting gifted kid burnout, which, you know, fair. But I have yet to see anybody like check that narrative and raise you. Hear me out on this. Undiagnosed autistic kid, rather than getting filtered through diagnosis and into like an IEP, gets put on the gifted track, comes up with complex systems and strategies to maintain their grades, maintain their place on that track because they've been sold on this narrative of like being a high achiever starts to see that fall apart in about middle school doubles down on said coping strategies goes through cycles of seeing it crumble in high school and then somewhere between the ages of 19 and 30 watches their entire life fall apart before their very eyes filters through various other diagnoses until eventually they're just like oh fuck i'm autistic the whole time it was it was just autism <laughs> Got you. Around 1 in 50 people are autistic. About 60% of autistic adults are under or unemployed. 87% of us have mental illness. Yep. Autistic people are nine times more likely than the general population to die by suicide. That's scary. We have an average life expectancy of just 54 years. And we deserve better. We deserve fucking better. In 2012, an autistic researcher named Dr. Damian Milton proposed a new theory. He called it the double empathy problem. And what he suggested was this. Maybe autistic people don't actually have social deficits. Maybe we just get along better with other people who think like us. Maybe hmm. autistic people socialize better with other autistic people and non-autistic people socialize better with other non-autistic people. Shocker. Maybe the difficulties that we see when autistic and non-autistic people try to socialize aren't because the autistic person has social deficits, but because autistic and non-autistic people are both bad at communicating in ways that make sense to the other. Boom. Now, to the autistic community, this made perfect sense. But a lot of autism researchers weren't so keen. I guess maybe they didn't like the idea that the whole history of autism research could be based on flawed assumptions. Luckily, in the last couple of years, a handful of autism researchers have jumped on board with the double empathy problem, and they've decided to test it scientifically. Ooh, let's in see. one brand new study by Dr. Catherine Crompton from the University of Edinburgh, they did this using a task called a diffusion chain which in Australia we know by the slightly politically incorrect name of Chinese whispers. Or telephone. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. You whisper a piece of information around a group of people, one by one, and you try to keep it as accurate as possible. And if you've played, you know that the accuracy part is pretty hard. The first person will whisper a perfectly innocent sentence like, This is funny. Today I need to pay my rent and get new tires. But by the last person, Donald Trump is president and the world's on fire. <laughs> well, in Edinburgh, they played that game with three groups of participants. The first group was all autistic people. The second group was all non-autistic or neurotypical people. And the third group was a combination of autistic and neurotypical people. The researchers found that the all autistic and all neurotypical groups were equally accurate in their information sharing. But equally the combined accurate. autistic and neurotypical group was significantly less accurate and less clear in their information sharing. Hmm. That suggests that autistic and non-autistic people communicate equally well. It's the mismatch between those communication styles that causes the problems. Exactly uh -huh. as the double empathy problem predicts. All right, bring it home. We need a paradigm shift in the way that we think about autism. Yes. We need to recognize that maybe acting less weird is not the best outcome for an autistic person. What? We need services and supports that will help us to live long, happy, and fulfilling lives while respecting our right to be authentically autistic. Revolutionary. And we need the kind of work that I do. Research yeah. led by autistic people that answers the questions autistic people want answered. Where do I sign up? Because the earth is not flat. Nope. And I am not a tragedy. Amen. Oh my god, you guys. I think I cracked it. I think I cracked the code. The other day, I saw a video that was like, if you understand people's behaviors, if you understand people's nonverbal body language, that does not mean you understand social cues. That is not a social cue. Nonverbal body language is not a social cue. And I was like, what do you mean? 
What in the fuck do you mean? If the nonverbal body language is not the social cue, if the things that they say are not the social cue, then what is the social cue? And I literally Googled what is a social cue, and it's like a combination of the verbal, nonverbal, blah, 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 blah. That's a social cue. And I was like, so what am I missing? And I, and I figured it out. I think I figured it out. And if you already know, fuck you. I don't care. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> this is a big moment for me. But a social cue is like saying, how are you? And to the neurodivergent mind, that sounds like a question asking how I'm doing. But it's not. It's not a question asking how I'm doing. It's a cue. It's a cue for you to say, I'm good. How are you? Because they don't want to know how you're doing. Even if you're not good, even if you don't care how they're doing, them saying, how are you, is a cue for you to say, I'm good. How are you? Nobody ever explicitly says that that's what you have to do, but it's just socially understood that that is what you're supposed to say. So if you don't pick up on social cues, you don't understand which of these questions, which of these nonverbal body languages, which of these gestures are cues for you to say something that everybody else understands is what you're supposed to say. It's an unspoken language. It's not, it's not, you can't figure it out based on their nonverbal body language or even the things they say because they don't say it. It's just something that everybody seems to understand even though it is never explicitly said. That's a social cue. <sighs>